Thank you, team, and good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to be with you this morning. You know, I have had a great week, and it has nothing to do with football, believe it or not. Even though Iowa exploded yesterday, <laughs> and, uh, and, and most of you know that I'm from Grundy Center, and they're actually living, uh, living out their best dream, too. They're playing in their fifth straight state championship game. So, you know, it's been a big week, you know, to watch the teams, but for me, uh, the reason it's been such a great week is that Giselle and I welcomed in a new grandson uh, this week, and so we're pretty excited about that. And so, I do have pictures, by the way. So, come see me. So this morning, I want to ask, I want to start by asking this question, what is the church? I know Doug started off this series last week, and he gave a great teaching. If you haven't seen that, I'd encourage you uh, to watch that and go find that on our website. But I want to ask you that. What is the church? And uh, is it a place to go? Right? I mean, we all came to church, and I'm so thankful you came. It's great. But did you know that in the Bible, the New Testament in particular never equates the church with a place? The word in the New Testament is ecclesia. It means gathering and assembly. So they assembled they met in public spaces, they met in homes, they met wherever. In fact, I once met an African pastor who, his church met outside his village at the big tree, right? And, and so that's where they, they meet, the church met. So is it an event to attend? I love events, they're fun. In fact, I would say Orchard does a great job of events. In fact, here's a couple of events that we've hosted recently, the out, outdoor church, remember that? that was. A lot of fun, a lot of people. Events can be catalytic. It's a great opportunity to to invite some friends to, but is that the church, right? The bottom picture is actually something we did just a few weeks ago called One Night. And it was crazy. We had like 700 kids in this room. It was just amazing. There was incredible energy and uh, it it was a lot of fun, right? But the most amazing thing to me about events and the events that we often do is to see our team and volunteers using their passions and their gifts. And it's amazing to watch the body of Christ come together to create these events. But is the church events? Probably not. Is a church a cause? Is it something that we join a cause for? Hmm. We'd probably say no. That's probably too narrow of a definition. But it is amazing to me to see what can happen when the church gets behind a cause. So recently, we were collecting gifts for Haiti, and uh, we, we filled up 370 bags for our partners in U- at UCI in Haiti. And I don't know, all, all those suitcases that we collected, they're all filled with these bags, and it's gonna be an amazing opportunity for them to impact their their neighborhood, their, their friends, uh, m- many people will be blessed because of this. And, and it's an amazing cause to get behind. So what is the church? Well, for this morning, it is this. We are a people. It's us who belong to God, who've been purchased by Christ. In fact, at great cost, right? At great cost. And I want to include this idea that we are sent into the world. In fact, that's what, exactly what Jesus said. The very first Easter, he said it. I want to look in John chapter 20. This is actually the first Easter, Resurrection Sunday. Jesus is out of the tomb. And the disciples are, are gathering together. And they're afraid. But somehow Jesus shows up in the midst, and this is what it says. On the evening of that first day of the week, that is Sunday, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. He said, shalom, peace, don't be afraid, I'm with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands inside, I want to come back to that, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. They were amazed. And then Jesus said, peace be with you. So what does he do? The first thing he says, he says, peace. And then he shows him his hands and his side. And then the very next words are this. As the Father has sent me, 
So I am sending you. I'm sending you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. In other words, we, his people, those who belong to Jesus, are those who are sent to represent Christ in the world. And quite honestly, that's where the rub is, isn't it? There's so much skepticism, so much mistrust, both inside and even outside, and outside the church, about, about the church. So the reality is, we, how we go really matters, doesn't it? How we represent Christ in our lives, in our families, in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, how we live out this calling of Jesus really matters. It really matters. In fact, Jesus, I would say, was trying to prepare his disciples. Even before he left, before he was crucified. And so I want to read from Luke chapter 22. In fact, chronologically, if you kind of think back, this is just before Jesus is tried and arrested and then tried and then crucified. He gathers with his friends, his disciples, in this upper room. And Luke records that. So does the Gospel of John. They both record this this event. And there's lots of things happening, but this is what Jesus, what what happens sometime in their midst. When they are gathered and Jesus is trying to teach them some things, here's what happens. Luke 22, verse 24. A dispute also arose among them as to which one of them was considered to be greatest. So here are Jesus, he's trying to teach them, he's about to be crucified, and they're having a conversation about position and power. Okay? And it isn't it true, whenever the church, whenever we, his people, are bound on position and power, we get into trouble, don't we? Well, Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lorded over them, And those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves." You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you a kingdom, just as my Father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So, for this morning, let me suggest this. What is the church? We are people who belong to God purchased by Christ and sent into the world as his servants because how we go matters it really matters so I want to explore that what do servants look like what do those servants actually what do they do what do they look like when they're going to represent Christ one of the things I'm convinced is we better demonstrate humility. I'm, I'm actually amazed. If you were to, let me just give you a context, right? Luke 22 begins with the story of Judas. Judas, Judas is ratting out his leader, Jesus, to the religious leaders. Why? Because Jesus isn't acting quick enough. He's not pursuing power and position. And Judas says, you know what? Okay, I'll help you. I'll help you point out who Jesus is to the leaders. And they pay him off. Then the the very next story kind of progresses. And Jesus is saying to to Peter and John, now go prepare this place because we're about to celebrate Passover. Right? And Passover is this huge event, an annual event for the Jewish people. And so they, they find this place and... And, and scholars call it the upper room. They go into this room together and they gather there. What does Jesus do? The very first thing he does is this. We read this in the Gospel of John. He gets down on his knees. He grabs a towel and basin and he washes the disciples' feet. In 
Think about that. He washes the disciples' feet. And then he says, I've set for you an example that you should repeat. You should do this for others. And then they have the Passover meal. And he literally redefines Passover. Which he says this, basically, I am, I am the sacrificial lamb. It is my body that's broken so that yours could be healed. It's my blood that covers over your sin so that you, you could experience freedom and joy. And then we read, the very next line is, they're trying to figure out who's going to be the greatest. I mean, isn't that just like human beings? It's like we miss it, don't we? We forget. And you know what? I'm guilty. What if we sat with this idea that Jesus is the one who's willing to wash my feet? Jesus is the one who is nailed to a cross. Jesus is the one who said, even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. We get into trouble, friends, when it's about our position, when it's about our power. So can we just demonstrate some humility and say, I could be wrong, you know? And I would just say that. I know that I've been wrong. The church, we've had to make hard decisions. I, I know that there are times we've been wrong. So can we demonstrate humility? Servants, if we're going as servants, servants demonstrate humility. Here's another thing that they do and they know. They know that they are deeply, deeply loved. Now, you know, I'm, I'm sure that in some ways the disciples didn't even know in the moment what Jesus was doing for them. They had to kind of reflect and remember. But in verse 28, Jesus does something that I think is amazing. He says, you are those who have stood by me in my trials. So in other words, you're the ones who stand by me. You said yes to me. You've been with me. Right? And then he does this amazing thing. He says, and I confer on you a kingdom. Just as my father conferred on me, one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in, in my kingdom. In other words, what he's saying is this. He is giving them, effectively saying, you are sons of the king or daughters of the king. You are a prince or princess, an heir to the throne. In other words, he's giving them an identity and promising them an eternal inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. And in my kingdom, you have position and you have power. So stop worrying about everything that's going on here and now. I'm giving you an identity and promising you an eternal inheritance. In fact, I'm convinced that gospel identity is this, that Jesus says to us, to you, you are my child. You are the ones who joined with me, and so you are my son. You are the son or daughter of the king. It's not something you earn or achieve. It's not something you do or have to discover or declare. You are not what others think of you. You're not even what you think of you. <laughs> you are loved. You are a beloved child of the king. And all you have to do is receive it. Jesus conferred on them. In fact, John chapter 1 says this, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, 
children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. You are loved. I have a really good friend. His name is Troy. And he has a son named Roscoe. Roscoe is severely disabled. I don't know. He has a number of different issues. Cerebral palsy, a severe seizure disorder. Basically, his life is lived from wheelchair to bed. He needs 24 hours care. And Troy has told me more than once. He said, you know, Brian, I have learned more. I have been taught more about grace, about what it means to be a beloved child of God from Roscoe than any other human being, simply because he exists. And he is loved. We are loved, friends. So what is, why is that such a big deal? So when I go into whatever social circle, or any, really any circumstance, it means that this, I'm okay. I'm held. I'm loved. Because of who I am in Christ. I don't have to prove something. I don't have to earn something. In fact, I can choose to do the next right thing, whatever that is, even if it's costly, even if it costs me my reputation, my livelihood, my living, I can choose to do the next right thing. Why? Because I have an identity that's found in Christ. I have an internal inheritance that no one can take away from me. There is no human being that can strip me of my dignity or my belovedness. There's no circumstance that can take it away from you. That's why the early church was able to do some of the things that they did because they knew they were deeply loved. We can be servants, we can be wrong. And we can be wronged, but we are still loved. Servants know that they are loved. Here's another thing that servants do. Servants lead with their scars and not their victories. I don't know if you noticed in John chapter 20 what Jesus did. He did an amazing thing. He said, peace, shalom. Chill out. It's going to be okay. I'm with you. Then what does he do? He shows them his hands and his side. He, he leads with his wounds and his brokenness. What if you, I know some of you are broken. I know you, some of you are coming in here with deep wounds. What if we actually chose to lead with that? Why? Because Jesus' scars and his wounds actually proved his resurrection reality. It's our woundedness that actually proves the reality of God's amazing, restoring, transformative grace. He has the power to heal. I don't know if you've ever heard of a Japanese art called Kintsugi. It's an amazing kind of artwork, which actually restores broken pottery. And the, the artists often use gold or platinum or silver. They actually want to highlight the imperfections. And they want to tell the story of the pottery and magnify the beauty of the restored vessel. I mean, I'm just a cracked pot. And that's true. I've been broken. And God has healed me. And God has restored. I want to lead with that. Not how great I am. I think the world would listen. 
The world wants to know your story. They want to see your beauty in the brokenness. Because you know what? Those broken potteries, those restored potteries, shows off the skill of the artist. Here's another thing that uh, servants do. They create margin to give generously. What do I mean by that? They have interruptible schedules. <laughs> they may be busy, but they are unhurried. In fact, some of the busiest people I know are, are some of our greatest volunteers. Why? Because they create space. They create time and space for God and for others. Recently at our board meeting, one of the board members was sharing how, I mean, he had just run the Indianapolis uh, Marathon. And uh, I know for a fact that he trained really hard because I followed him on Instagram and, and he would share. And he had a goal. His goal was to actually qualify for the Boston Marathon. So anybody that's done that knows that that's a pretty significant goal. And so he actually ran this race and he was doing great. He was in a, in a pace group and he was, the first half of the race, he was right on, right on schedule. And then he started to experience some, his hip problems and IT band problems and uh, started kind of falling back a little bit, but he was thinking, I, I'm gonna do this. And about two thirds of the way through the race, he saw a woman in front of him just fall fall off to the side. And he thought, yeah, I guess I have a choice to make, don't I? And he stopped. And it's a good thing that he did. No one had a phone near him. They were kind of between stations. And uh, so he called 911. And he waited there for about 20 minutes to help her. And he said this. I thought this was great. I could never hear the story of the Good Samaritan ever again if I didn't stop. You know what, it, it's like that. Servants have interruptible schedules. Why? Because they're more concerned about the other than themselves. They're learning to live out of a set of priorities. And they're learning to create margins so that they can respond. They can respond to their family. They can respond to their friends. They can respond to the greater church. They can respond to their neighbors and all of those things. And it's not just time. It's also giving of themselves, like their gifts and their passions and their talents. They give. They create margin in their giving. They also get, create margin in their finances. Some of the most generous people I know are not the richest people. But what they've done is they've created margin so that they can give. Why? Because they want to see God's kingdom come and his will be done and the mission to move forward. Servants create margin to give generously, even sacrificially, to the things of God and to the work of God. Here's the last thing I want to share this morning. Servants also lean towards others. Lean towards others. What do I mean? Leaning towards, I believe, is the posture of love. They don't run away. They actually lean towards. They don't fight against. They fight for. They lean towards. So, okay, I'm going to ask you, would you please stand? I want to, I want to do this thing together. So I want you to kind of spread out your feet about shoulder width, put your weight on your, on your feet, kind of feel the weight on the bottom of your feet, okay? Now I want you to lean on, onto the balls of your feet, just kind of lean forward. Feel that? You feel some of the tension in that? Love is not something just that we initiate, it's also how we respond to circumstances or what others do to us. It puts up with annoyances. It keeps no records of wrong. It leans to, do you feel the tension in the back of your legs? If you're leaning forward, you will, right? That's love. You've got to feel the tension in that. This is what the Apostle Paul says about love. It says, love is not something I receive. Love is something that I do. Love is patient. 
Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love leans to. Love leans to my child that's driving me crazy. Love leans towards my spouse in the middle of a fight. Love leans towards my neighbor whose dog just pooped on my yard. Love leans to and feels the tension of that. Church is hard sometimes, but it is worth it. If the best use of your life, your time, your talent, your treasure, is to invest in something that will outlast your life, then the one thing that will last for eternity, the one thing, is the family or the people of God. The church. It is worth you giving your everything. So what is the church? Let me just leave you with this. It's people who stand with Jesus. That lean towards others. And are learning to connect their Sunday faith with their Monday through Saturday life. We go as servants. Let me pray. God, here we are. We're standing. And we want to stand with you and for you. But we also want to lean towards those around us. Help us to care for them and to go into this world as servants Lord, I know that uh, I have messed up in that. I've too often been concerned about how I look, the position that I have, or the kind of authority that I carry. Lord, help us just to go. Go because you call this. Go because you said to us, even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. Help us to serve well. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you may be seated. Thanks for doing that for me.